relax. It's ASMR. Hello, everyone. Well, as you know, if you have been listening to any of my videos in the last eight months, I have been working on completing my master's degree, and that means writing a thesis. And that process has taken a lot of my time. And so one of the things that had to be sacrificed was the amount of videos that I was able to put out on this channel. So even though I have tried to maintain at least once a month, you all have known the process that I'm going through. And several of you have asked that I read my thesis as a relaxing video hopefully ASMR. If anything, it should help you fall asleep. So this is my fourth revision of it, so it's pretty close. There's still some things that need to be addressed, and that's what I'm going to be going through and highlighting and circling with my pencil as I read through it. So hopefully this will help me not only create a video for you all, but be a valuable tool in my editing process. Because sometimes when you're reading just in your mind, you kind of skip over things. But forcing yourself to actually read it out loud forces you to take it word by word. And hopefully this will highlight things that need to be changed. So I hope you enjoy this. If anything, I hope it helps you fall asleep. But if it provokes some thought, that's awesome as well. And before I start, I want to say that this is a paper written from a Christian perspective. It focuses on the church, primarily on the contemporary American evangelical church. And it is written from a place of love and hopefully a place to help people think and change as I highlight some of the problems in this paper. So this is not necessarily a harshly critical paper from a standpoint of dismissal, but hopefully from a standpoint of correction. So with that being said, let's go. So the title of this thesis is Releasing the American Christian Church from the Religious Scholasticism of John Calvin to Discover the Diegetic Nature of Morally Efficacious Good. Time has not been kind to the American Church. The last 150 years in particular have seen it adopt an increasingly defensive stance its shouts of glory, glory, hallelujah, becoming increasingly frantic as it loses its ability to shape common culture narr cultural narratives or the framework of intellectual discussion. The days when it acted from a clear manifest destiny seemed like a dream in the midst of retreat and retrenchment. Systems that once seemed like allies have shifted focus to other priorities and values, leaving the church feeling powerless and abandoned. Within the church, Theories explaining this separation usually center on a helpless narrative that frames the church as a victim of secular godlessness, which has mounted an attack that the church is inexplicably incapable of counteracting. The instinctual reaction to this is one of defense, maintaining cultural homogeny through a system of further isolation and separation, promoting the creation of a subculture that is increasingly hostile and antagonistic towards the larger culture. This only exacerbates the problem, leading to a pattern of increasingly extreme rhetoric, doctrine, and praxis. These extremes do nothing but highlight how far the church has removed itself from the surrounding culture. This separation and loss of status brings grief, and the beginning of grief is denial. For years, the collective hopes of the church have centered on prayers for a miraculous revival which sees the larger culture come to its senses and return to the church with tears of repentance and requests for forgiveness. But when this wish is not fulfilled, denial ultimately leads to anger, and continued separation leads to estrangement and resentment. 
the desire for the culture to be silent and listen to the church becomes a desire for the culture just to be silent. There are those within the church who no longer are no longer content with waiting for a tearful reunion or a mutual understanding. They seek to force their will on the culture by reviving and developing some of the darker aspects of the Protestant theology, a theology that stems largely from the works of John Calvin. It is the roots of Calvin's theology that have influenced the American Protestant evangelical expression of the Christian faith in ways that are counterproductive to the intent of the gospel and the purpose of the church and society. It is important that we address these core issues and find a way forward that not only amplifies the gospel message, but also dramatically changes the dynamic between the church and its surrounding culture. The church must interpret, the church must interrupt its grieving and find a new energizing purpose before it reaches the next steps in the process, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. It is the purpose of this paper to show the church that the reason it is losing the struggle against a secularized culture lies in the fact that, from the very beginning of the Protestant Reformation, Calvin planted the feet of the church on the wrong battlefield and equipped ED, equipped it with a set of tactics that it is poorly designed to implement. Do I need that in there? Maybe. This is not an attempt to completely refute the tenets of Calvinism, but to point out much of the Church's current difficulties are logical consequences of the way in which Calvin presented and defended his tenets, and their subsequent application. This paper proposes an alternative perspective which achieves some of the same goals as Calvin's, but developed from a more realistic view of humanity's strengths and weaknesses, and with an eye towards a more effective engagement with modern culture. The author begs the indulgence of the reader over any oversimplification with handling the subject at hand. Okay, I say over and over, and I say hand and hand. Too many repetitions. The constraints of time, space, and innate ability necessitates only a cursory treatment of this topic, which deserves a more nuanced and exhaustive discussion. It may help the reader to view this work as only a summary, a first discussion of the topic. If this paper prompts questions that spur further exploration, then it has achieved its aim. Calvin and the Church To more firmly establish the character and motivations of Calvin, we must begin with the broader religious, political, and social context of the early Reformation. The Reformation emerged out of a dissatisfaction with the social structure of Europe, particularly a dissatisfaction with the authority of the Catholic Church and how it used that authority. 500 years later, we often have the misconception that Luther's act of nailing the, his 95 theses was a thunderbolt that took society by surprise. In reality, it was a particular and powerful expression of what was already a growing zeitgeist. When Luther was swinging his hammer, he was not founding a new religious expression of the gospel. He was a monk seeking to start a dialogue about a topic he found very troubling within his church. One could say that the drama of the Reformation has less to do with Luther's theology and more to do with his character. If Luther had been of a more accommodating nature or a more gentle disposition, events could have unfolded in a very different manner. As it was, Luther's character was well suited for the task he unknowingly set for himself when he made his disagreements with the Catholic Church public. While his initial motivation was simply to start a debate, When met with resistance and denunciation, he had no problem splitting from his mother church and standing on his principles. Luther's irascible character, dogmatic stand, and coarse language are a lightning rod that focuses the attention and encapsulates the drama of the nascent Reformation. Luther was an accidental revolutionary who took to his role with willing alacrity. Because of this, from a historical perspective, Calvin stands somewhat in the shadow cast by Luther, but this belies Calvin's lasting influence on the character and direction of the Reformation. Calvin's motives were distinct from Luther's. Where Luther was happy in a more reactionary stance regarding the church, Calvin was more, much more proactive and methodical. Coming half a generation after Luther, the Reformation was already in motion as Calvin grew up in France. The debate surrounded him, and he shaped his opinions in this milieu of new ideas because Luther was not the only one challenging the Catholic Church. 
There was a general dissatisfaction with accepting the word, accepting that the world worked as the church taught. The Renaissance, a generation earlier, had opened the minds of many to concepts and philosophies that were both ancient and new. While the church still wielded a tremendous amount of power, its hold on certain positions was weakened and seemed to slip from its grasp the more it attempted to exercise its authority. Politically, kings and governments challenged the church's authority in a variety of ways and with variety, varying levels of success. Cosmologically, scholars challenged the Aristotelian underpinnings of motion, position, and form that medieval scholasticism taught and that the church endorsed as biblical truth. Philosophically, ideas defining the nature, capabilities, and identity of mankind were changing. This was the cusp of the Enlightenment. And I need a period there. It is in these beginnings that Calvin developed his theology and anthropology. His focus was not as much on the past of the church, but on its future. Calvin had a deep passion for the church as a corporate body. His conflict was not with the institutional power of the Catholic Church, but with its leadership. The papal structure that he saw as having, quote, neither the doctrine of Christ nor discipline, sacraments nor proper ceremonies, unquote. Calvin believed that in order for the church to have a future, it must rid itself of all that it had acquired under the influence of the Roman system. In a letter to Cardinal Saladot, Calvin wrote, quote, If now you are willing to accept a definition of the church, which is more agreeable to the truth, say that it is a community of all saints, extending over the whole world and through all ages, but that, being united in the doctrine of Christ and by one spirit, it desires unity of faith and brotherly concord. We deny that we have ever been the slightest dis in the slightest dispute with this church. On the contrary, we reverence it as a mother and have no other wish than to remain in its bosom. You are well aware, Saladet, that we are not only in more exact harmony with the primitive church than you, but that we strive for nothing else than the restoration of the church to its primitive condition." Unquote. He was not challenging the authority of the church as a concept, but the Catholic expression of that authority. Calvin wanted to establish a new church that maintained the power and political position of the Catholic Church, but drew its authority from the scriptures alone and not from papal decrees. This is an important distinction to recognize. While other luminaries of the Reformation saw the political role of the church as one of cooperation alongside civil government, Calvin sought to maintain and expand the power and influence of the church, now preaching his reformed message. He saw the church as a corporate entity that was a political force in its own right, governing the actions and deserving the reverence of the individual. This is the church that Calvin sought to establish and that he vigorously defended throughout his life. A lawyer by education, Calvin's expression of his belief had a practical and political bend to them. By 1532, Calvin reached a point of influence and respect in Parisian society that allowed him to make his Reformed beliefs more openly known, and he was acknowledged as the head of the Reformed Party in France. His first and greatest object was to reform Paris and the court, and in this manner to produce a new movement which might be propagated throughout the whole kingdom. To Calvin there was only one law found in the word of God that man should obey. The church was the means by which this law was interpreted, and the state was the means by which this law was spread and enforced. Calvin's Goals One characteristic that Calvin holds in common with other Re Reformation figures is his insistence on the superior role of Scripture in governing all aspects of church doctrine, discipline, and practice. Calvin knew and understood the historic writings of the church fathers, but he rejected most of them as having no authority above his own analysis of Scripture. Calvin saw the Word of God as the only source of knowledge needed in human affairs, and he sought to reduce or remove all other guiding lights that might challenge it, including human reason, intellect, and will. To him, comma, Scripture must stand alone, unchallenged and unquestioned. Humans must be humbled to a degree that necessitates their complete reliance on Scripture to shape their worldview. They must realize their complete lack of ability, status, and power over their own salvation, destiny, and bodies. This motivation is the driving force behind Calvin's most influential work, one which he revised and expanded throughout his life. In the pages of The Institutes of the Christian Religion, 
Calvin lays out his theology and anthropology in great detail. His belief system rests on five major tenets, each serving to further define the relationship between God's knowledge, righteousness, and authority, and humanity's complete ignorance, sinfulness, and helplessness. The first of these tenets is total depravity or inability which states that men and women are incapable of understanding their need for salvation. We have no ability in ourselves to desire it or turn towards it. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to generate any desire for repentance. The state of humanity is one of utter helplessness. Calvin uses the imagery of our will being bound, compelled in its disposition to choose sin always. The second tenet is unconditional election. Since there is no self-generated impetus towards desiring or even recognizing our lost state, we cannot self-select for salvation. God selects whom he will redeem in his infinite and unquestionable wisdom. The corollary to this is that even if a person intellectually knows their need for salvation, if God does not elect them, they cannot do anything to affect their state. They are shut out from the kingdom. The third tenet of limited atonement flows from the first two. If we cannot use any part of our will or reason to incline ourselves to salvation and are totally dependent on God and total and are totally let's see depend and on God, who has preordained only a select number to receive his gift of salvation, then it would be a waste bordering on sacrilege to suggest that the death of Jesus was for all of humanity. Calvin is forced into this position by his logic, since to suggest otherwise would put the Trinity at cross purposes. The fourth tenet of irresistible grace continues to extend the logic of the efficaciousness of Christ's atonement and further strengthens the emphasis on humanity's helplessness regarding salvation. It would also be a waste of Christ's blood if a man or woman could opt out of their election. Therefore, Calvin believes that if we are elected, we cannot resist the call of God through the Holy Spirit. The fifth tenet, Perseverance of the Saints, addresses the state of the elect after salvation. They do not gain a free will, but are still incapable of affecting their status regarding their redemption. Calvin taught that there is nothing we can do to revoke our state or undo the saving grace of God. We are now irrevocably part of God's collection of saints. Calvin addresses the obvious objection that there are clear cases of those who have walked away from their faith by concluding that they were never really, truly of the elect. He retroactively redefines the relationship with God and others. They were no true Christian. What on the surface seems to be a concern over properly assigning God the glory and honor he deserves is actually all about power and authority. To Calvin, if God's plan is to be effective, then humans must first be humbled, their agency completely negated. Calvin's Methods The ramification of this negation cannot be confined to salvific matters alone. Calvin's five tenets define the tenor of the relationship between God and humankind on a fundamental level. The first and most obvious change is one of authority. The insistence that Scripture alone is the sole authority of the Christian life necessitates the abandonment of other sources of authority. Calvin rejects nearly all other theological works that came before him. This is a key point of contention between Calvin and his critics, such as Pigius. Calvin spends many pages of his writings defending his position on this point. The outcome of this change is a scripture stripped of its historical context. Calvin reserves the right to interpret the word of God to himself alone. The second change involved in this transfer of power is the intensification of God's attributes. The assignment of a characteristic to God not only implies a positive possession of those attributes by his person, but also implies a de-emphasis bordering on negation of those attributes in his creation. In Calvin, we find that God is not just gracious, but but that his grace is irresistible. God knows all, therefore humans can know nothing. Human agency is inconsequential in the presence of God's will. And then we have some quotes from Calvin. All we say is that God is in charge of the world which he established and not only holds in his power the events of the natural world, but also governs the hearts of men 
bends their will this way and that in accordance with his choice, is the director of their actions, so that they in the end do nothing which he has not decreed, whatever they may try to do. Accordingly, we say that those things which appear to be in the greatest degree due to chance happen of necessity, not by their own innate properties, but because the purpose of God, which is eternal and steadfast, is sovereign and in governing, in governing them. But we do not, for that reason, discount the means which God has appointed to be subject to his will, nor do we say that those things are without effect or superfluous, which serve the fulfillment of the divine purpose. Second quote. We say that human affairs are not by some blind or random chance turned this way and that, but are controlled by the fixed purposes of God, so that nothing can happen other than what he has decreed in the beginning. All things are subject to his power, and so there is no created thing which does not, either of its own accord or under coercion, obey his will. Accordingly, everything that happens happens of necessity as he has ordained. Satan, too, and all the wicked are submissive to his authority so that they cannot move beyond what he has commanded, for they are constrained by his hand as though by a bridle or halter, so that now he restrains them, since it pleases him to do so, and now he drives them on and guides them to execute his judgments. Third quote. All this teaching has no other purpose but to make the believer rest, free from anxiety in the omnipotence of God. He then will fear neither fortune nor chance, and will not be afraid for himself because of wild animals or human beings or devils, as though the reins had been let go or broken, and they came under their own impulse without any control from above. Instead, he will entrust his soul and body to God, and so with a calm and tranquil mind sink back into the protection of him whose will he knows determines everything, and whose hand brings everything to pass. End of quote. The third change is a subtle but important application of this intensification. As God's sovereignty is complete, all aspects of morality now belong to God alone. Actions, thoughts, and objects no longer inherently possess the quality of being good or evil. They are assigned this quality externally by God. The Godhead alone is the arbiter of what is good, and it is beyond our capability or prerogative to understand or question his will. I think Godhead is one word. These changes to the relationship between God and humanity must spill over into how we view and interact with one another. You cannot degrade humanity to this level without it affecting society on a fundamental level. We cannot, if we cannot rely on our own attributes to provide us with any meaningful guidance, then we must view ourselves differently on both a personal and collective scale. The Ramifications of Calvin's Anthropological Theology In order to rescue the Church from the moral decay of the Catholic Church and return it to its truer, more primitive form, Calvin set forth a theology meant to humble humanity and produce a complete dependence on the Church as moral arbiter. He did this by fundamentally altering the power dynamic, removing agency not only from those in the papal system, not only from all Christians, but from every human, past, present, and future. While Calvin does not deny the existence of free will or reason, he he defines them with the intent of negation. Therefore, if reason is corrupt, if the will is hopelessly bound to sin, and we cannot recognize, choose, or accomplish good, then humans are in a truly wretched state. We cannot form moral judgments or even recognize morality, and so we cannot retain responsibilities in this area. As such, we should not be entrusted with making, adjudicating, or enforcing our own laws. If Calvin's theology is true, then we must believe that humans are incapable of ruling themselves, either on a personal or collective level. Some would disagree with this analysis by arguing that Calvin meant for his theology to only apply to the soteriological relationship between God and his creation, and not to other aspects of human life. However, Calvin's orthodoxy is matched by an orthopraxy, that clearly demonstrates the breadth of his intended application. Calvin's Path to Geneva Calvin's attempts to bring Reformation, the Reformation to Paris and its government were not well received. The breaking point came when he wrote a sermon for Nicholas Kopp, the new rector of the Sabonne. 
to preach during the Catholic feast of L'Autresan. The sermon was such a blatant declaration of the Reformation doctrine of the justification by faith that the authorities could not let it pass, and Calvin became a wanted man. He fled the country to avoid arrest and trial. The following year saw Calvin live for a time in Italy and Germany before eventually returning to France. During this time, he wrote the first version of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which he dedicated to the King of France, Francis I, hoping to convert him. Francis was an ardent Catholic, comma, actively persecuting all who opposed the church. That reads better. Calvin did not achieve his goal, but as the acknowledgement of his writings spread, so did his fame. He was in many places now a wanted man, and he decided to move to Germany, where the climate was much more accepting of his reformed ideas. His path led him through the Swiss town of Geneva, which was going through a revolution of its own, ousting its bishop and installing reformed preachers. Farrell, the leader of this movement, seemed to realize that his character and oratory were incapable of maintaining the cohesion of the movement. He visited Calvin to entreat him to stay and lead the reformed uprising. When Calvin made it clear that he was determined to continue on, Farrell pronounced a curse upon Calvin. to set a profound effect on Calvin's disposition towards his future calling. From then on, Geneva, its people and its welfare, and its governance were the force that determined the course of the rest of Calvin's life. It was at first a reluctant endeavor, but soon, while Calvin had no particular passion for the project, he had a d deep sense of calling and responsibility towards establishing a practical application of his theology. That is a very awkward sentence, and I need to rewrite it. This strong sense of duty saw him through the extremely contentious relationship he had with the spiritual and civil authorities of the city. Calvin had a very specific idea about how the city should be governed. To him, the center of all authority was the church. From it emanated the preeminent laws and judgments that established the way of life for the city. Calvin saw the civil authority as supporting and protecting the church in it, acting and enforcing its commands. Needless to say, this was not the same perspective of the city's government, and circumstances came to a point in which they ousted Calvin and those associated with him from the city. Calvin's Exile and Return to Geneva After his exile, Calvin attempted to move on. He found a position in Strasbourg as a pastor, teacher, and counselor. He continued to write and revise his Institutes of the Christian Religion, but the events and welfare of Geneva were never far from his mind, primarily because he regularly received news of the continued efforts of the churches in Geneva to restore him to a place of authority. In 1541, Calvin's main opponent in Geneva died. This made way for his return. Working from this advantageous position, Calvin set out the terms of his return and entered the city with far more power than he previously held. The next few years saw dramatic changes to the laws, customs, and daily life of the city. The law, as set out in Scripture and interpreted by Calvin, reigned supreme over all other forms of authority. The moral power of his character was indeed so great that he would leave no vice unpunished. He desired the severe justice of the law to take its course without regard to person. Thus a lady related to him was condemned by his advice to suffer a public punishment because she had been dejected in some improper proceedings. His character and judgment were as a moral rule for Geneva, and the whole church. In order to form a right estimate of the man, we must be careful not to forget that he who was the defender of a new theocracy was moved rather by the spirit of the old prophets than by the mild apostolic spirit. Calvin pursued the idea with particular zeal, and his influence on the Gen Genovese constitution is then most correctly characterized when it is described as theocratic. He desired that God might be king, and the temporal power should rule only in his name, that it should employ the law and exercise its influence for the salvation of souls, since it is only in the idea of a theocracy that the union of the church and state can exist, both according, both according to this, having in their ends the aim and glory of God and the salvation of the lost world. Solemnity and sober living became enforced by law. 
Punishments for crime became severe, and he applied the death penalty to many transgressions such as adultery. But the law extended beyond the curtailing of what was traditionally considered curtailed from what tra- this should be is traditionally. But the law extends beyond the curtailing of what is traditionally considered bad behavior and illegal activity. Calvin's law also dictated social, personal, and religious expression. Dancing and frivolous songs were no longer allowed. Many of the city's festivals were repurposed to a more Christian commemoration or were banned outright. Calvin's rule in Geneva, Calvin's rule of Geneva, saw 150 people convicted of witchcraft and executed. Children were hung from the gallows or beheaded for disobedience to their parents. All of this was not in opposition to Calvin's theology, but was a natural expression of it. Calvin's actions do clearly show how we should apply what we learn from him. He has shown us the practical application of his tenets. Okay, this is kind of a redundant sentence. Sola Scriptura was, to him, a maxim that applied beyond the walls of the church, penetrating into every aspect of human endeavor. Humanity was to be controlled by force of the law into correct behaviors and morals.